so thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks to the organizer. Very pleased to be here. Um, so I, the, the theorem that I will mention uh, in the second part of the talk is a theorem with Bob Gerard regarding the leapfrogging phenomenon for the gross pitaevsky equation. I've been working with Philippe Gravja and Evelyn Mio trying to extend uh, this analysis or to adapt this analysis to the Euler equation and uh, we have failed so far. <laughs> but uh, I will, so, but then I, I will start explaining some, so start with some basic things on the, on the Euler equation and, and try to, to give the intuition. So first, wha what, what leapfrogging is, what are the difficulties that are still uh, there, and then I will show the result for gross and explain the proof. And you, you will see also where the gaps are for the, for the Euler equation, and, and maybe that will uh, give some ideas to some of you, or some of you would have some ideas to make some progress. Um, so the, uh, there is a point, I guess. So the I I will start with the with the two D uh, Euler equation in uh, yeah. so the two D Euler equation which I wrote immediately in a vorticity formulation so omega is a function here and uh, say on R two and v is a velocity f uh, field of the fluid which is recovered from the vorticity through the the Biot-Savart law so the gradient perp of the uh, green function of the Laplacian. And uh, as you know, this equation, when in R2, is a, is a transport equation. So the initial uh, vorticity field is just transported by the flow, which is uh, given by the velocity field. So you think of particles, you evolve them with the velocity field, and uh, then you just transport the vorticity by, this, uh, by the solution uh, of this flow. Uh, this is known to have some infinite number um, first because it is a it is a transport equation all functions of the vorticity uh, are conserved in particular the total mass but there are other interesting uh, conserved quantities in particular the center of mass which i have rescaled here the angular momentum which is sometimes uh, written in terms of the center of mass centered at the center of mass already and uh, and the energy there are, uh, <coughs> there are many uh, much more uh, conserved quantities and um, one of the consequences of these uh, uh, conserved quantities among the many consequences of these uh, conserved quantities is the fact that uh, when you have a, a positive vorticity uh, at initial time then it remains somehow concentrated for all time so if it has compact support say at times equal zero then most of its mass will stay in a, in a bounded region for all time because that depends only on conserved quantities and, and a very easy way to, to, to see it. But it, of course it requires that omega that the vorticity is a constant sign, otherwise uh, you see that it doesn't work. So I split the mass as a part which is uh, in a ball around the center of mass of omega and uh, the complement. Now the, the part which is on the complement you just, since it is x is a distance at, m at least r from the center, then you can uh, minimize 1 by this. And, and, and there you see the, the <coughs> one of the conserved quantities appear, the angular momentum. And so therefore you, you have this uh, lower bound on the mass of vorticity contained in the ball of, of radius r centered at this center of mass, which does not move for the, for which is a conserved quantity for the, for the Euler equation in terms of the, in terms of the total mass. So if capital R is sufficiently big, you can make that as, as small as you wish. So it is a weak form of concentration of the vorticity. But of course, this only works for, uh, this will have a, an, an implication for later. This only works if omega is a sign, uh, because otherwise you cannot do that. Okay, and there are solutions, of course, which are known not to stay uh, compact uh, in, in space. Well-known solutions are if you take a patch with a plus and a patch with a minus, those two will uh, behave like a traveling pair. And so they will not stay localized, say here, close to zero in space, but you could say, well, but they are still localized one uh, close to each other, but you could uh, cook up a different thing like that and you would have two pairs that, that escape one from each other. So you, you take different signs and so uh, 
there, there is no way that, that it would be uh, localized there. So, so this is something which is uh, for which the sign of the vorticity is, uh, is, uh, is crucial. And uh, now the kind of solution I will look at is precisely such kinds of initial data where I will put a scale epsilon and so I will consider patch which are, this is just to, to, to put a parameter in the problem, I, I could also use the distance between patch and make it uh, big but it is somehow easier this way so they will behave with a diameter of size epsilon and so that they have positive mass the omega will be like epsilon minus 2 to the minus 2 so into the, uh, in those patch. So if you do that of course they and you rewrite this estimate for one patch then you, you have that uh, up to a, a factor epsilon square all the mass is still contained in a ball of, of, uh, radius of radius 1. But this of course only works if you take one patch because, uh, because the smallness the smallness of L, uh, no. was that? the smallness of L, of course, uh, x square is small only if omega is concentrated close to a point. But if you take two of them, then if x square is small here, it's not going to be small there. And so this uh, this uh, very simple uh, heuristic does not work if you take uh, if you take multiple patches. Okay. So you cannot just use the invariant in that case. To, to tell that, and the goal would be to say that such structure uh, remain in time, possibly with a motion that you will later study, but, uh, but it's not sufficient to use the invariance to do this. But what uh, Marc Euro and Paul Virenti did uh, in, <coughs> in the 80s is to say, uh, well, um, the what we are going to say, so the, the Biot-Savart law is a, is a linear law that, that, that transports the omega to the v and uh, since the Euler equation is a transport equation if initially your uh, vorticity can be divided in two, say I have one patch and a second patch, I transport each of these patch then I have a way to split the vorticity at later time. So I, and this is just because it is a transport equation and so uh, the Biot-Savart law is singular only at the origin, okay? And so when, when this patch is going to move by the Euler equation, I, I can consider the, the speed, the speed which is generated by himself, by Biot-Savart, and look at it as the singular object. But then there is also the speed which is, uh, it, which is implied by the other patch. And since initially they are at a finite distance, a O of one distance, then as long as they remain like that, I can treat this other term as a, as a smooth or as a Lipschitz term. Okay. So what they did was just now, even if you have multiple patch, just consider one of those patch, it will, it will and, and move it with a flow where there is a vol velocity which is given by the Biot-Savart law of itself and then the Biot-Savart law implied by the other patches you just see it as a forcing term, as a Lipschitz forcing term and it is Lipschitz as long as the two patches do not come close uh, one to the other. You reformulate this as an abstract uh, as an abstract flow and then you compute the, the time derivative of the invariance or what was invariance for the pure Euler equation and uh, you just get that the, time, the ti <coughs> time derivative of the center of mass now is just moved by the, by the force F and, and the important thing is the, uh, the, ang the angular momentum here uh, satisfies this equation and if you notice that this quantity is zero just because this does not depend on x. So if you integrate this on x by definition of pt you get zero. Oh, forget about this, I put it out of, the, out of the integral. So this is zero. Now you compare this with this and you make the difference. You have f at x and f at the center of mass. So since f is Lipschitz the distance you can bound it by x minus pt and then you get the x minus pt at the square times omega which is, which is lt. So the, the angular momentum under such kind of flows uh, is, is, is a good candidate for a, for a grand value inequality. So if it was epsilon square uh, initially it remains, uh, it remains of size of order epsilon square uh, for times of, uh, of order one. But of course there was a, an a priori assumption is the fact that there is no interaction between the two uh, and, and, and so, so you need kind to, to bootstrap. 
uh, and to be able to say that uh, if they are initially at finite distance, then at least for an order one time that will remain the case. And, and that is a difficult, uh, that is a something uh, which is not easy to prove and it is the, it's actually the difficult part in all the work of, uh, of Marc Euro and Paul Virenti and in rough terms this is exactly what they proved. So if you start with patches that, are, that have size epsilon whatever their, their, their form, their precise shape, they do not need to be disks and at, at, at a distance which is order one then for times of order one they still remain separated and uh, they are no longer of size epsilon after a positive time. So they, they cannot prove that, but this is kind of an open problem called the, the filamentation problem. If you start with something of radius uh, one, how far can the, the vorticity go? And, uh, and when you once, you, once they are able to prove that the, 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 the vortex patch remain uh, at uh, order one distance one from the other, then deriving their motion is just uh, looking at the, at the, uh, at the, the PDE and, and, uh, and exchanging the omega by a delta. And the fact that they are concentrated just say that you approximate. This is just a consistency if you want. And so once you know that the, vor the patches are concentrated, you derive the motion law uh, the the, the so-called point vortex systems for the for the for the patches, uh, but so this is the difficult part of the proof, and, and, and this is the con this is the consequence. Okay, this is what I noted there. Um, this system is an Hamiltonian, which is which I was there, the Kirchhoff uh, Hamiltonian here, and actually, of course, it has to do with the uh, energy of the. Uh, the Euler energy of such configurations, and which I wrote, which I wrote there, and the reason why I wrote it here was that uh, the the Hamiltonian of the point vortex systems here only depends on the relative positions of the patch, uh, one with each other. So x i is the, is the center of mass of the patch i, and x j is the center of mass of the patch j, and they are small, uh, so so at the limit you consider them as only as points, and uh, the the energy is a main term. If, if, if uh, x i x j has distance one, this is the term which is order one as a main term, uh, which is logarithmic diverging in epsilon, but which does not depend on the position of the points. Okay, and so that's the main, uh, th 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 that's the uh, the main ingredient in the f in the fact that uh, you can use this. Uh, this analogy here, uh, somehow you can treat the different patches uh, separately. Okay, uh, that can be reflected in a way in the fact that the main term of the energy is somehow independent of the position of the point. So that, that will be something will be different in, in, uh, in the axis symmetric 3D in, in, in gross pitayevsky This is something I wanted to... Um, so th this is just the, the integral of uh, 1 over x cut off at, uh, at, uh, at epsilon. In Oh, that one has, has, uh, is, uh, has been uh, thoroughly studied, uh, uh, depending on the, on the science. Well, if the, if the signs of the lambda i, lambda j are all the same, then, then, uh, uh, then you don't have collision problem. It's normal. If you have different signs, then you know you have those solutions that, uh, that collide and so on. So th this is a problem that has been... The long-time behavior of this flow is not necessarily invented. Uh, th this is finite time, uh, so yeah, <laughs> there is a double scale there that should. Okay, uh, yes, one remark also is that this, uh, this theorem by, uh, by Marc Euro and Paul Virenti uh, works for, for arbitrary, uh, arbitrary shape of patches. In particular, it does not use at all the, uh, some optimizing property of the patch, okay? It could be an ellipse, it could be... Uh, an arbitrary patch, and so somehow it's not, if, if you want to, to make a parallel with, uh, say, uh, uh, multi-solitons and so on, it has nothing to do with that in, in the sense that uh, it does not use this, uh, um, it does not use the fact that, for example, one would be an optimum of the energy at a constant uh, momentum and so on. It just uses the fact that if they are sufficiently far apart, then they, they do not interact. It's just a, a long-range non-interaction. And what could say, well, yes, w w can we say more if uh, the patches somehow have some solitonic uh, behavior, in, in particular if they are some optimum of uh, some conserved quantities and there are some constraints? 
And uh, so, so those objects are, are known and the, the optimum are known. So if for example, uh, if, you, the, if you consider the circular patch, then its stability has been, uh, has been uh, studied. And uh, in particular, one and Paul Virenti have proved that if uh, you consider a patch which is initially sufficiently close to the circular patch uh, in L1, then it, uh, it stays close in L1 for all time. Also because th this just follows from uh, inequalities on conserved uh, on, uh, sorry, on, uh, yes, on this conserved quantity here, just the, the, uh, the energy. And um, here also the remark that I would like to make, uh, having in mind parallel with, uh, with interaction of soliton and so on, this looks like a very good, uh, so omega naught is the circular patch and omega is here is the, is the, uh, the, the candidate patch. This looks like a non-degeneracy uh, condition, the fact that there is a, a spectral gap, uh, it, it actually isn't. And the reason is the, the lack of differentiability uh, of the structure, uh, the manifold on which you, you look at the, so the manifold of vortex patches is not something <laughs> which has a, a nice uh, vector structure. And, and the, perhaps the, the easiest way to see it is uh, so consider the vortex patch, so this, so this is a candidate. Now another candidate would be to, to dig a hole here and to put it here, of course. So you rem this you can do in, in one way, you can do it with a plus, but you cannot do it with a minus. So if this is a permitted direction of variation, the opposite of this variation is not permitted, okay? So somehow there is not a, it's not a, there, there is no tangent space and, uh, and you cannot see this inequality as a non-degeneracy inequality uh, of a second derivative of something. Okay, so this is the main uh, the main difference. And one other way to <laughs> to to see that this would be absurd to think in in this way is to replace the L1 norm by the L2 norm. Uh, you would you, you would just get a square here and uh, and a power four here, and then you would say oh, this is not at all a non-degeneracy. It is a degener it is a degeneracy. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why. Euler, with respect to Gross-Pitayevsky that I will present later, is, is badly behaved, is the fact that the, the, uh, the co-adjoint orbit of a vortex patch, so the, the, the set of, of candidates for Euler flow starting from a, from a patch, does not have, at least for the L1 norm, which is the one that has been studied, does not have a good uh, manifold structure. Uh, so this was a, a stability theorem in L1 for uh, initial uh, vortex patch that were close to uh, close to the circular vortex patch, and Sideris and Vega in a, in a short and elegant paper uh, proved that it, it is actually a global uh, nonlinear stability estimates. But they have a proof which relies on, on uh, different uh, conserved quantities than E, so this was based on the energy and they used the conservation of uh, momentum and, uh, and angular momentum. And again here I have, I have put this uh, factor 2 which somehow is the main uh, one of the main trouble. And, and also the L1 norm is, is something you, you would like to avoid, I will explain later. So now I go to, uh, the, so leapfrogging is something about vortex rings. So it's not in 2D, it's in 3D, but we'll look at the analysis in, in 3D axisymmetric flows uh, without swirl here. So I wrote the, uh, the Euler equation in, uh, in 3D. Again, you recover the velocity from the uh, vorticity through the bureau savar law, and I will co only consider uh, vorticities that are uh, independent of, so I look in cylindrical coordinates, so uh, z, r, and theta, and I will always use this. Uh, so this is r, z, and the slide this would be called h, so this is the half plane which you obtain in cylindrical coordinates, and I forgot about the theta. So if omega is, uh, is independent of theta and aligned with E theta, in, in that case, the velocity is, uh, is a vector field in this, uh, in this uh, half plane uh, H. And, uh, and the, um, the Euler equation translates into an equation for omega theta, which again is a transport equation, but a transport equation not for omega theta, but omega over R. So if you, you divide, I should have written it differently, if you divide this equation by R, you would have d dt of omega theta over r is, uh, is a v gradient of uh, this quantity, and therefore this is, tra this is transported. The, the fact is that it is transported by a velocity field which is not divergence-free. 
Okay, divergence free if I look at it as a velocity field in H. Okay, so, so th this makes things a little bit different, but, but still you have the fact that this quantity is, is transported. So if you go to higher values of R, the omega is increasing. Which okay. Uh, now I wrote the... Uh <coughs> now the question is, assume I take a patch, a little patch like this of vorticity and uh, what's going to happen to it. So here was a patch, so here it corresponds to, a s to, to, uh, to an annulus. Okay, if I draw a little patch. And I wrote, so this is just heuristic, I wrote the, uh, the Euler equation in, uh, in weak form for, uh, here uh, for an arbitrary omega uh, which is uh, axisymmetric. And, uh, and uh, you can play a little bit with the right hand side using the, uh, so this is the expression of the fact that the omega is the curl of V, it remains of, of, this, uh, of this form, as, uh, and this is the fact that the divergence of V as a three-dimensional vector is zero, which translates this way in the, in the, in the R space H. And then you get an equation, a weak formulation uh, for the Euler equation, where on the right hand side you only get the V, okay? you don't have the omega uh, anymore. And, and so what can we guess about the, this is the, the way I prefer to understand the motion of a vortex rings. This is the formulation I think it is the clearer to understand because uh, we know it is a transport for omega over r. So, so this is a patch, it's going to stay a patch, at least, uh, at least uh, locally concentrated. And uh, we want to, to, to guess its motion. So to guess its motion, it suffices to take a function phi, which is an affine a a fine function. Okay, so if I take phi to be affine, then uh, the, the here those two terms that have second derivatives of phi will not be present. Uh, or, and I cut, I cut them off sufficiently far away where there is no, uh, where V has decreased alre already, say. And uh, so I have to, to understand these two forcing terms in order to guess what will be the motion of a, of a, small, uh, of a small vortex patch here, so of a, of a thin uh, vortex rings. And uh, the fact is that the, 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 the Biot-Savart law in 3D looks locally like the Biot-Savart law in 2D, well, for, uh, for axis symmetric flows, it looks like the Biot-Savart law in 2D. And so if I have a small patch, uh, the, the, the velocity at least close to it will look like that, like, uh, like uh, 1 over r times, uh, times e theta. Well, r, no, say 1 over rho, where rho is the distance to the center of patch and not this r. Okay. And so if you, look at, if you look at it, you see that this would be like 1 over r square times a cosine square of theta. And so this will integrate to something non-zero and it will integrate precisely to log of the, of the cutoff distance here of the patch. Okay. 1 over i square integrated, whereas this one here is uh, 1 over r times cos theta, 1 over r sine theta, and that one integrates to 0 at main order. Okay, so the, 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 the main, so this will give me the, the time derivative of the position, uh, if omega is essentially a Dirac and this is a, an affine function. This is the main term, it will go in the z direction with a speed which is proportional to 1 over the distance to the to the center, uh, so the radius of the annulus here, and uh, multiply by the logarithmic of the width of the vortex. So this is, uh, 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 if you take into account the the mass of the uh, the mass of the patch, which is at power one here and at power two here, you get that the main order in the in the speed is this lambda over r naught. So the intensity divided by the radius of the annulus multiplied by the log of the thickness of the patch, which we assume to be as epsilon at least at, uh, at initial time. Okay, and uh, this is uh, something that Helmholtz already knew, but he didn't do the computation uh, with the equation in vorticity formulation. He, he just used, uh, 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 he just computed the very precise asymptotics for the velocity V uh, close to the tube. And he argued that the main part, this one over r, had to cancel in some in some sense because it, it only make the, the vortex rotate on itself. But he already had uh, uh, precise computations and uh, and even to the next order, which was uh, which were uh, accurate. Uh, actually, 
the existence of exact uh, vortex rings can be uh, so exact in the sense that exact traveling wave solutions, so solutions that do not deform in time except for the, for the vertical translation, can be constructed by maximizing the Euler energy, which I wrote here uh, in the uh, vorticity uh, formulation, under constraint that the momentum is fixed, sufficiently big, if it's too small there, there is nothing, and uh, the fact that the uh, omega over r is a transport of what it was uh, initially. This is also something which you have to impose, otherwise the maximization problem becomes uh, trivially uh, uh, infinity. And okay, so this was uh, long known. It was an idea of Arnold to use such, uh, such optimizing constraint minimization to get uh, exact traveling waves. And it, uh, there's a lot of work uh, which in the end makes a very precise the fact that this problem is a solution provided p is larger than actually the, the momentum of the ill vortex and, uh, and it has a shape of a vortex ring and so on. Uh, on, on different, uh, so this is for an exact uh, traveling wave solution. On a, uh, a different direction, uh, Benedetto, Cagliotti and Marc Euro proved that uh, all most maximizers of this problem behave like a like a vortex ring in, in, a, in a weak sense, in the sense that um, there, there is a point close to where, we, where you expect and, and a patch which has most of its mass there. Um, so therefore it is a, a weak, a weak <coughs> form of the Euler equation and this form is going, and the, this patch is going with the, with the right speed uh, uh, asymptotically. Okay. So that has been done for uh, one vortex ring and the extension to the case of uh, two or more vortex rings, which would be the, the exact equivalent of the point vortex system uh, that Marc Euro and Paul Virati derived, has not been done for Euler. And so this is still a, an, an open question. So uh, this is uh, something which I wanted to show, just a video of a vortex ring to show that this is a, an extremely, this seems to be an extremely uh, stable uh, solution of Euler equation. It was uh, uh, Kelvin who proposed uh, to build it just with a uh, cardboard and, uh, and uh, which, I, which I tried myself. And as you can see, it looks very stable. It can go up to 10 or 20 meters in the lab without uh, changing, uh, changing form. There is nothing very precise in the disk inside. I just, I, it was actually my daughters who built, who built the hole with a pair of scissors. And it goes really, it goes really far without uh, without, without changing shape. And uh, in the second half, so th this was uh, th the study of vorticity for 3D Euler flows was in this 1858 paper of Helmholtz. In the second part, he has a, a paragraph which is not preceded by computations. It, it's, it comes rather uh, oddly, but he foresees what will be the behavior of the interaction between vortex rings. And so he claims that if you take two of them, so this one is going in this direction, and that one will come close, what's going to happen is that the exterior one is going to grow its radius, the following one will shrink, since it will shrink, it will have a smaller radius, and so it will be quicker, because the speed is one over the radius. And so we we'll catch that one, pass in front and then they will exchange their role, that one will be behind and so they will play this leapfrogging, one will pass inside the other, actually I have a video uh, that was made by uh, Lin in Singapore, it, it seems, okay, so this is, uh, this is a lateral view of what's happening and you can see at least uh, one uh, what leapfrogging motion. A I thought this was a very, very delicate uh, thing to reproduce uh, in the lab, but I, I have some students from uh, Grande Ecole uh, close to Jussieu that came to me because they, they had to do a TIPE. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, we tried together to, to reproduce this and, and to, to measure some. Uh, and so in the end, they were able, they were at uh, SPCE where they were given um, uh, many, uh, many facilities. And, uh, you can see almost see one one of the leapfrogging motions with uh, the, an apparatus which was built uh, with the hand and uh, and with uh, very few money. <laughs> uh, it is less uh, 
less beautiful than the previous one. So, so this is the phenomenon that we would like we would like to explain or to, to derive uh, rigorously. And as I said, uh, we, we, we have failed for the uh, for the Euler equation, and I, I will show you how it goes for the gross pitayevsky equation and try to 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 mention the link uh, between the two. So uh, the gross pitayevsky equation is a, is a nonlinear defocusing Schrödinger equation. It has a parameter, epsilon, which is fixed in the equation. That's one of the main difference with Euler. Well, in the previous one, in 2D Euler, you can fix it in the initial data. And because it is transported, it will, uh, it will remain inside. But it is also a length scale, epsilon. So you will see that vortex tubes for gross pitayevsky will have somehow a fixed epsilon uh, scale here. Whereas for Euler, it was the difficult thing, proving that uh, concentrated vorticity remains concentrated. Somehow that will be the easy part in the gross pitayevsky uh, equation, but there, there will be some parts that are more tricky to deal with too. So uh, u is, a, is with values in the complex, and, uh, and so it is the uh, Hamiltonian flow for this uh, Ginzburg-Landau uh, energy. And the analogy which uh, uh, I propose is the following. When you have a u here, you compute its uh, uh, Jacobian um, in the following way. So uh, maybe the easiest way to understand this formula is to think of u as being a, so think, since it's complex value, think it as a modulus exponential of a phase. Then from u you compute, we call it current, j of u, which is uh, u cross gradient u, is just uh, the gradient, basically the gradient of the phase, so rho squared the gradient of the phase. There is a, you see here in the gross pitayevsky equation, uh, energy, there is a penalization. When epsilon is small, this is a penalization of the fact that the modulus of u is not close to 1. So you should think that for, for uh, functions that have fields that have a bounded uh, uh, energy or controlled energy, rho should be close to 1 in most of the domain. So the current is essentially the gradient of the phase. And, uh, <coughs> and the, the vorticity the defined for gross pitayevsky is the curl of this, uh, of this current. And so you see in particular that if, uh, if you have a pure phase, that is if rho is exactly equal to zero, then the Jacobian is the curl of a gradient is, is identically equal to zero. So the main difference here with respect to Euler is that in Euler, when you have the vorticity, you recover the velocity. The, the velocity is, is completely uh, defined by the vorticity through bio -Savar. This is not the case in gross pitayevsky So in gross pitayevsky uh, you see, if you are a pure phase, the vorticity is identically zero, but, the, the, but the, um, the velocity can be an arbitrary gradient of a phase. So there is some additional uh, degree of your freedom. You can think of it also, I will mention that later, on the fact that somehow gross pitayevsky as a, as a non-compressible component, whereas Euler was uh, incompressible, as a compressible component, whereas Euler was, uh, was incompressible. And this is something I, I mentioned that. So uh, I have written here the weak formulation of the, uh, of the gross pita, sorry, not the weak formulation because it does not characterize this, but I have written a weak form, uh, uh, a weak identity for the evolution of the Jacobian J of u, when u is an uh, is an axisymmetric solution of the gross pitayevsky equation. This is the equation where th this is the capital F. The exact form do does not have uh, such uh, interest here. But the, the point is that I have written it here in a form that resembles very much what I wrote before for the Euler equation. And actually so much that I can write these two equations here. This is for gross pitayevsky and this is for Euler with the exact same capital F, just that it acts on different objects. For the uh, gross pitayevsky equation, it acts on the full gradient of U, which contains both the, what I call the little j of U, the current, but also the non-compressible uh, non part. Whereas uh, in Euler equation, it just acts on, on V. Okay. And so in, in a sense, to, to close the equation for gross pitayevsky you need also an equation for the, for the compressible part. And this is the one I wrote here, which is uh, uh, because J of U is not uh, divergence, uh, is not divergence free for R J of U in, uh, in uh, cylindrical coordinates, but it is almost divergence free uh, which you can see here 
it's uh, I've put the epsilon on purpose. This quantity is part of the energy. Well, if you take its its uh, square, this is the potential part of the energy. So this equation tells you that on average in time, if you average in time, the divergence of j is is epsilon. Okay, so this is the link with the incompressible uh, Euler, but you need this uh, additional equation. This is the loss, whereas the gain was the fact that the length scale was fixed. Uh, also, another analogy, which you can see at the level of the, of the existence of vortex rings. The, the, here, I just recopied what I had for the Euler equation. You can get exact vortex rings for Euler by maximizing the energy under momentum constraint. For the gross pietayevsky you can get exact traveling vortex rings by minimizing the energy under the exact uh, equivalent constraint. So, so this is an, ad an analogy, but also a very big difference because one is a maximization problem and the other one is a minimization problem. So, th so the analogy tells you som somehow that uh, there is a saddle. For, for Euler, you are a maximizer in the, uh, in the set of fields that are incompressible. And if you allow compressibility, then you are a minimizer. Okay, so it's not it's an analogy, but uh, there is a somehow a sharp uh, difference here. Uh, one is a, man, is a maximization, and the other one is a minimization. Okay. So uh, okay, now how will 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 we study interaction of uh, vortex ring and and it will in which regime? So uh, as I said, Marcurel Pulverenti did their analysis for ar arbitrary. Uh, arbitrary vortex patch, we will use the energy and so we will use greatly the fact that some objects are optimizers of energy under fixed momentum. We will use that uh, in a crucial way, so we cannot work with this very broad uh, setting and so I have to explain precisely what our initial data which will look like and their, uh, their energy. So uh, to do that I consider uh, an arbitrary curve uh, uh, oriented curve uh, in uh, in R3, which I see as a think of it as a as a line of current uh, capital J, and I consider the vector distribution which has a two pi. This is something also which is important for gross pietayevsky One of the main difference with Euler, there is this quantization for gross pietayevsky uh, which you do do not need uh, for Euler. So I consider two pi times the integration along the curve x. Of, uh, so this is a vector distribution, this is just circulation of, uh, along the curve C. Now when you have a line of current, I think, I think in terms of uh, electromagnetic, uh, you have an induction uh, capital B, which uh, satisfies this uh, divergence B equals to zero and the curl is, is exactly capital J, which you recover by Biot-Savart. And when you have the induction, you can go to the vector potential, which satisfies now these sets of equations, and then you get the, the vector Laplace equation of the vector potential is equal to J. Now, uh, now if you are in cylindrical coordinates, I will take just uh, one point here in the, in the half plane, uh, little a, and, and I will tell you what is a, a a Dirac, uh, the equivalent of a Dirac mass for Euler is a, is a Dirac along, uh, along the circle. And, uh, and so the capital A is just a solution of, uh, of a, ve a vector Laplace equation with a, with a Dirac on the right hand side, uh, which you can uh, write in this way. You can, uh, <coughs> you can uh, tell what the capital A is uh, even with uh, complete elliptic integrals. This is, <laughs> this is something that, uh, that is that can be done, but that uh, is not really uh, the most important part. The thing is that since there is a 2 pi here, we can uh, define the uh, gross petaeski vector field U that will be related to capital A, and in the sense that, that its vorticity will be precisely this uh, singular circle. Okay, and what you do basically is you use uh, this formula. Forgot about the little r. This is something just because we are in cylindrical power coordinates. But what you say is that the gradient of the phase of u is just the gradient perp of the of the of the potential. Okay, so uh, this would behave like uh, like a log close to the singularity, and so the phase will look like a like a typical. Uh, um, Dirac vortex uh, in 2D, you get this equation, this sets of equation for you. So the curl is 2 pi delta and the divergence of J is zero to this uh, change of 
of metrics. So this is the equivalent of uh, vortex points. Now I have to say what is the equivalent of uh, circular patches. Circular patches were the, uh, the, uh, the optimizers uh, for energy. The optimizers for energy in the Ginzburg-Landau framework are known and they are called vortices as well. So they have a they have this uh, particular form, they, uh, they behave like exponential i theta, so this is in 2D and they, and they have a profile which is like this, so you will get a profile, this is the modulus of u will look like that on the singularity, it will not be uh, x over modulus of x, but you regularize it by something which has a width of order epsilon. And this is energetically optimal in a sense. It is the best way to regularize a, a singular uh, vortex rings in the context of the gross pitaevsky equation. And then you define your field just, uh, just in this way. So this would be uh, the equivalent of, uh, of a disk, of a vortex disk in the 2D Euler. Now, if you want to take many of them, uh, since you have essentially unimodular maps in C, you just multiply them. So this would be the singular one, you multiply the, the complex fields and, and the, the singular ones, you, you, com you, you also multiply them. So now you have defined this way a field which has a number, uh, A1, A2, which has a number of vortex rings at different points. And you can compute uh, the expansion for its energy, I have written it here, and also check that its vorticity is close to the sum of Dirac masses. A and here is the difference with respect to Euler. Recall in Euler, the L1 norm was a natural candidate, well, uh, the youth candidate to measure the, the spreading of vorticity in gross pitaevsky turned out that the, the dual of Lipschitz function is, uh, is something which is well behaved and, and and which, uh, which also has some advantages because it tracks more the fact that uh, small parts want to go to infinity. For the W minus 1, 1 norm, if a, if a small part goes to infinity, you see the distance at which it goes. Whereas for the L1 norm, you just see that it's not there, but it does not make the L1 norm does not make the difference between being at distance 1 and being at distance 1,000 from there. So in some sense, this is something this is kind of estimates that would be nice to have in Euler 2 rather than L1 uh, distances. And the, the second important thing here is that the main term in the, in the energy now depends, of course, on the position of, of the points. And not only this is the equivalent of the interaction uh, in the log xi minus xj, which we add into d now, there is a, a, a main term here, here which depends on the, on the position of the, of the vortex of the vortex rings. Okay, so uh, since uh, Gross-Pitaevsky is the Hamiltonian flow for the, uh, for the uh, Gross-Pitaevsky equation, uh, at the limit one would expect that the position of the vortex rings obey the Hamiltonian flow for the limit energy which we computed, uh, which is H epsilon, which I, I just wrote here. And this will actually be the, the content of the theorem. I just mentioned that this flow here, which, is, which I call the leapfrogging uh, ODE, as a, in addition to the, to the Hamiltonian, as a conserved quantity, which is the momentum, which is just the sum of the square of the radii of the, uh, of the vortex rings. And actually, not for the ODE, but for the full gross Pitaevsky, we have seen that there was the conservation of this, which was the equivalent of the uh, uh, of the angular momentum for Euler and uh, for uh, patches you have the, the, same, uh, the same asymptotic. So this is the... the we uh, no, 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 don't pay attention to 39. <laughs> this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so now the statement of the theorem. I claim that the right... Uh, the right scaling to see the interaction between vortices is this one. So when vortex cores are at a distance of order one over square root of log. So I wrote them as a, sen uh, a main point A naught and, and the distance here are of order one over square root of log. Somehow if they are closer 
then the effect of uh, of being 3D will not be will not be seen. If they are too close, they would behave like the 2D, like straight vortex filaments, and you w one would recover the the equivalent of uh, Marcuro and, and Pulvirenti result. And if they are too far apart, then they will just behave like vortex rings with uh, with too few interactions between them, and there will not be an interesting. Uh, limit OD. And uh, the theorem is the following. So, so this is an assumption uh, on the initial data and I assume that I have a bound. Now I, I let those points evolve by the limit, what, what I think to be the limit ODE. And I, in the statement of the theorem, I, I assume that the BI epsilon of S remains bounded. Okay, this is something you, can, you always have for, for some times and, and we will see later even for times of order one maybe a little bit bigger in some regime. I assume that initially my vorticity is concentrated close to those points. This is what I call the concentration scale. And I assume that the energy of my initial data is not too much bigger than that what I expect to be the optimal energy for such configuration of points. I do not claim that uh, this, is the, the, this is the optimal one. It will be at little o, o or the little o of one. This will be a consequence of the theorem, but I just expect, I assume that I have not too much energy and this is what I call the excess. And the theorem says that if both the concentration scale and the excess are not too big uh, initially, then, then they remain not too big for, an, uh, for a time uh, of order one. And this, this I can make as small as I wish by my initial data and we have this uh, this loss which we cannot uh, which comes from technicalities in the proof there, there there has to be something here and and the point is that we have an exponential here but with no singularity in epsilon and there is no epsilon one over epsilon or something like that here whereas there was a one over epsilon square uh, in the equation so for order one we can say that the behavior of the for times of order one we can say that the behavior of the Gross-Pitevsky equation is essentially the same as the behavior of the leapfrogging uh, ODE. Now the leapfrogging ODE I, I have depicted here its uh, its phase diagram when there are only two uh, vortex rings. Uh, in that case, so there, there are four uh, free parameters because uh, each, uh, each A1 and A2 both have two degrees of freedom. But because of conservations, uh, first you can, uh, well, you, you have the momentum that fixes uh, one leaf. And uh, there is also a, a translation invariance if I have those two points and I move them by a, a, fixed, uh, a fixed vector in the z direction. The, the, the motion will be equivariant with this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, transformation. So I can just look at the difference between the altitudes of the two uh, anuli and use it as a, as a function to describe the Hamiltonian. And the other one, as I said, was the conservation of the momentum P. So the, and P was the sum of the, the square radius of the two. So I can define this new variable eta by these two quantities. The sum is always P and uh, so Eta, if eta is equal to one or minus one, means that one of the two vortex rings is much bigger than the other one. And uh, when eta is zero, it just means that they have the same, uh, the same uh, radii. And so if you plot the Hamiltonian H epsilon in terms of eta and z, then you get this uh, phase diagram. And so you see that here in the center, you have a, a region where uh, solutions are periodic which means that so eta goes from positive to negative and z positive negative, which is exactly what you, you observed in the video in the sense that sometimes one anuli is smaller the other, and the other one is bigger and, and they, they, they catch each other. But there are different regions here. So this would correspond to the place where uh, the vortex rings have too much different radii initially. And so they will interact, you see, they, one is going closer to the other one, but they, they, it has they, they, the difference is too big and it, it's not catched by the other one and, and it will flow inside. For example, you take a very small one and a very big one in front, it will pass through, but it is not, sufficient, it is not sufficiently close to interact truly with it uh, in long time, it will escape. But there are also some uh, very nice regions here where uh, one will come closer that one will accelerate. It will not pass inside, but they will finish like, like this. So it come close and then that one goes in, in this direction. You can also 
at least numerically look at the at this that the leapfrogging systems for three or more uh, vortex rings. There are some very nice uh, uh, examples, like like for the the point vortex, uh, like for the point vortex uh, system. Uh, okay, so I do not have time. I had some slides uh, on the proof, but I think my time is over. So I just finished to to say that. Uh, uh, one would like to do the same for Euler. The difficulty is the concentration. Uh, and so the main question, I, I think, the one, one good way to try to, to tackle it is replace the L1 norm in the, uh, in the uh, Vega Sideris or one pool Virenti estimates by a norm which is a, a more adapted to catch the part of the vorticity that would that would want to go to uh, infinity is it possible to do it with dual of Lipschitz? We've tried that, and I, this is actually wrong. But uh, one may think of other way to measure the the expansion of vorticity in this filamentation problem in in Euler. But uh, this is a difficult question for on which we have failed. Well, thank okay. you very much. Thanks. Yeah. If we see on the face, uh, face, uh, <coughs> so uh, they are periodic orbits, huh? Yes. And so they, uh, they are of which order? Because it means that, so you can see many circles, I mean, in your... Yes, yeah, so the, the, you mean that the, this, this requires a time of order one. So uh, if, if this is of size k times square root of log epsilon, this will be essentially exponential of k, so these are actually very flat things. So the motion is, is actually, it, it's periodic it, in time, but it does not look like something that does this. But it more does, when k is big, it's just something like that. You don't see anything for a long time, and then it, it exchanges. You wait for a long time, and then it exchanges again. When, when you get closer to, to, the, to the heteroclinic here, and, and this is... And it is, uh, you see, many, uh, certain many periods uh, all uh, uh, the in, in this, uh, in this uh, theorem, uh, where was that? In this theorem, we can actually go to times that are log log of epsilon. And, and well, log log of epsilon is one, it really depends on the constant which you have in front, if you really want yes. to have figures. But, but this requires a time of order one in this, in this scaling. So, uh, in principle, we can, if we take epsilon very, very big, very, very small, sorry, we can see ma many leapfroggings. Many, many of those, yeah, we, we can follow. Uh, it's not just one part of the branch, no, we can see many of it. Right. Uh, are there some other questions? Yes. Uh, uh, what happens if uh, for your, your unimodular map uh, at each circle you change the degree? Say you take opposite uh, degree for... Uh, ah, yes, then, 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 yes, then I, I, have a, I have a video for that. So, so now that the two, uh, the two... So in the leapfrogging set, they are both going in the same direction and they interact. Now, if you take uh, different uh, signs in the vorticity, they, they will collide, well, or depending on where they are. But, and this is, uh, this is also a video by Lim, and uh, w the life seems to be much more complicated in that case. <laughs> yeah. Mathematically, you would say there is something which you don't like because you, you, you start in a, in a cylindrically symmetric situation and you see the, the solution is no longer cylindrically symmetric, but life is never cylindrically symmetric. <laughs> <laughs> This, this is by far, this video is very popular in the fluid mechanics community because you see you recover some vortex rings which have each of them has half of uh, of a part which initially was this and also this is a real experiment this is not a, a simulation you see another vortex rings which have these calving waves uh, so this is probably much more difficult <laughs> when you take opposite uh, opposite vorticities Thank you very much again for this nice talk. Thank you. Thanks.